You are welcome to this preview of the book of Colossians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. Reading from the Legacy Standard Bible of 2020. Suggested learning objectives for this session are as follows. Participants will be able to define Paul's use of the term fullness. Participants will be able to evaluate past and current philosophies compared to revealed truth. And participants will consistently behave as Christians. We are, we are in the midst of the book of Colossians and dealing with Paul's struggle on their behalf. Mm. If you are studying in a group, have someone read verse 1 aloud. If you are studying alone, stop the video and read the verse carefully. Then restart the video. Ask others to make comments and pose queries about the verse before you share your own. The term struggle is an athletic image. You might ask, against whom was Paul struggling? A possible reply would include Ephesians 6.12, We wrestle against spiritual beings, for the book of Ephesians was circulating in the same towns with the book of Colossians. Then pose this query, How do Christians struggle on behalf of others who are far away? Cite verse 1 9. We do so through our prayers. And then, how do clergy grow their church from a distance, just as Paul was doing, for he himself never visited Colossae, Laodicea, or Hierapolis, but he did coach the leaders who planted those churches and were growing them? Have someone read aloud verse 2. Pose this query. What are four results of Christian faith that neither mysticism nor philosophy can provide? Find your replies within the verse. The replies will include encouragement, brotherly love, assurance, and full experiential knowledge. Have someone read aloud verse 3. Can Christian faith stand against sound logic and scientific scrutiny? Talk about experiences trying to answer other philosophies or scientific arguments. And then ask, what is one claim that Christian faith can make that science and logic cannot? Find your answer in the verse. We appeal to Jesus Christ, whom we believe to be God incarnate. This phrase, in Christ, occurs a number of times throughout this epistle. For we are in union with Christ, we are in the Spirit, we are in Him, and we are in God. We belong to Him. Someone read aloud verse 5. Note the phrase, in Spirit. Interpretations of this phrase. Some say that Paul's spirit was transported to Colossae, where he could see them. Others say that Paul and the Colossian Christians share in the same Holy Spirit. Others that he and they had a same purpose, they are of one mind. Others suggest that Paul is merely assuring the Colossians of his affection for them. Read aloud verses 6 and 7. Note that the phrase, received Christ, has more than one interpretation. Some suggest that they had accepted Jesus as their personal Savior. However, that expression never occurs in the Bible. Rather, we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Some say, well, this refers to how Christ came to dwell in them by the Holy Spirit. And yet others say, well, this is how they made Jesus Lord of their life. Or was Paul merely saying that they were to maintain the same faith that they had when they first learned about Christ? Have someone read aloud verse 8. After they have made their comments and posed their queries, you might ask, how do Jewish and secular philosophers 
still appeal to Christians? Well, it's because they deal with clear thinking, morality, and social issues, which are also important to Christians. The mention here of elementary principles of the world could refer to just basic ideas prevalent within a culture, or perhaps referring to ruling spiritual beings which are present everywhere. Read aloud verses 9 and 10. Note that the term fullness has more than one interpretation. Some have suggested that fullness refers to the totality of the ruling aeons. However, that was a 3rd century philosophy called Gnosticism, reason for which some liberal-minded scholars suggest that Paul could not have written this epistle. Some say, well, Paul may have been inventing a new theology different from that of Jesus, that is, Pauline Christology. More likely, Paul is referring to all of the attributes of Yahweh, the God of the Bible, as already taught in Judaism, present in the physical person of Jesus Christ. Read aloud verse 11. Note that there is more than one interpretation to what Paul refers to by circumcision. For example, there is a spiritual circumcision of the heart, as expressed in Deuteronomy. Some suggest that this is a metaphor of Christ's crucifixion, that is, the death of his body was a kind of removal of our sins that he carried in his body. And others suggest that God imputes to believers Jesus' status as an obedient Jew. The expression body of flesh, does this refer to Messiah's crucified physical body? Or to believers' old way of life, which is now crucified or is being crucified by their faith in Messiah's death? Or is this Christ's crucifixion imputed to believers as their own death? Have someone read aloud verse 12. Ask about baptism in this verse. Is it referring to water baptism or to a kind of spiritual baptism, as John the Baptist had predicted in Mark 1.8 and that Paul himself affirmed in 1 Corinthians 12.13? And whose faith are we talking about in this verse? That of the convert or that of the believing community? Or both? And what makes the change happen? Well, this is a work completed by God. Read aloud verse 13. Ask, how did we become dead? We died spiritually by committing transgressions. And as Gentiles, we were born spiritually dead because we were not part of Israel. And just what was wrong with being uncircumcised? We were excluded from all of the advantages given to Israel. So what does God do about our sins, that is, our transgressions? Whether Jew or Gentile, he forgives both you and us. And what about our uncircumcision? We'll look back to verse 11. Read aloud verse 14. If there was a certificate of debt written against us, what was it that we owed to God? As his creatures, did we not owe him thanks, worship, and obedience? Jewish people use the term translated decrees or as regulations for God's revealed laws. And he nailed it. It, in Greek, is a neuter gender pronoun relating back to the neuter gender noun certificate nailed to Jesus' cross. Finally, read aloud verse 15. Note that the phrase, in him, can be translated as by it, that is, by the cross. And this public display, where did it occur? 
When? And how did it happen? Think of the public crucifixion of Jesus. How does Jesus, as the head over all rule and authority, triumph over them? Is there some sense in which Jesus went to the cross as the head of the spiritual realm, as well as the Messiah for human beings? Discuss together. Did Jesus' death and resurrection erase the human debt and proclaim the coming death of fallen spiritual powers who are now disarmed, being neither redeemed nor to be forgiven? By way of summary, Jesus Christ is the firstborn that is preeminent over all creation. This includes all of humanity on one side and all of divinity on the other side. Thus he is head of the church and also head of the divine council, the church consisting of Jews and Gentiles, the council including spiritual rulers and authorities. The cross provides forgiveness for human beings, but merely disempowers the spirits. Thus we are transformed from the realm of darkness into the kingdom of the sun, wherein Jesus Christ is now firstborn from the dead. The first resurrected, who will resurrect us, is believers. Poses a query to those present, what is one truth, insight, belief, or action that you learned from this passage? For our next study, Let us read a chapter of Colossians each day in versions that we trust, and then study carefully Colossians 2, 16 through 23, about faith-destroying religious ideas and practices.